culture on a table. If, any, if anybody, if everybody, and some of the hardest headed people in his society were the religious leaders. These guys were so brilliant, dumb. They were so dumb that she had them. Parable simply means an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He had to tell them stories to express his idea of what anyone means. Here's one story. I've given it to you there and you know she's let's look at it together. We're going to kind of go through it today. Uh, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king. So here's Jesus going to tell the story. And what's he trying to illustrate? The kingdom of heaven. What's he putting it in contrast to? The kingdom of the earth. The kingdom of the earth is a hierarchy uh, that, that says you've got to be of the right class, the right income, blah, 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 blah. But in the kingdom, it's a little bit different. The kingdom of God. And the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. So there are people that were on, ready? The list. Okay? You know you're on the list when you open your mailbox and inside of there is a flyer from David Stanley Chevrolet. And you'd open it up and there's a key. And it says, if you will bring your key down, you drive away in a car. Do you know why you got that? Because you're on the list. And there was a list. The list. The idea that the Jews were God's chosen people. They were special. That there was a difference between a Jew and a non-Jew. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. You're one or the other. You know, very few people are a mix. But there were some. Those were called Samaritans. That's where a Jew and a Gentile got together, had an offspring, and he was neither or. He was, so he was a Samaritan. So you're either a Jew, Samaritan, or a Gentile. And only the Jews in this structure could follow God. And they had all these rituals that they would have to go through. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, and you'll find guys that weren't Jews that decided to follow, become followers of Jehovah, of God. And they would have to go through all kinds of gruesome things to make themselves worthy to be in the family of Abraham. I mean, stories like grown men having to circumcise themselves. There was no anesthetic. I'm just saying. Ouch. They didn't have knives. They probably used stones. We can stop right there, right? But they were so dedicated to getting in the group that they would do that. And if they weren't willing to do it, they couldn't be in the club. And Jesus is saying there was this feast that the king was putting together for, the, for his son. And he sent, out, he, he sent out to those that were invited. And he's talking about the Jews, okay? When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. But they all refused to come. So those people that were on the list said to the king, no thanks. So he sent it out other servants to tell them. So at first he thinks, maybe they didn't understand my servant. Maybe I need to send a better communicator. You know, somebody who can put a little muscle behind it. So he sent other servants to tell them. The feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cow cattle have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited ignored them. Say ignored them. Here's the, here's the idea. The king was so intent on having people show up for this wedding, show up for this dinner, show up for this party. But those people that had the golden ticket, these people that were on the list, that were in the club, decided to ignore the king. If you got an invitation... To spend 15 minutes with the President of the United States, would you ignore it? I wouldn't. If you had the opportunity to have dinner 
with Michael Jordan, would you take it or would you ignore it? And yet these people had an invitation from the creator and they chose to ignore it. That's what he's saying. Come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited ignored the servants and they went on their own way. Oh no, we don't ever do that, do we? We don't ignore God and walk our own way, do we? They walked our own way. One to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers. They insulted them. Our society doesn't do that today. And they killed them. And the king, obviously, and of course, and rightly so, was furious. And he sent out his army, look at this, to destroy the murderers and to burn their town. Please don't miss this. That which the invited guests had put ahead of the king's desires, he took from them. And you wonder why this country is struggling financially. Because that which we have put our trust in is being taken from us. Really? You don't believe me? You seen that, that memorial downtown? And how our innocence as a city was removed because suddenly we realized we're not as safe as we all thought we were. That which they had put their trust in, that which was more important to them, the king took away. And he does all this and he's telling the story for a reason because he's talking to these religious people, these people that should have got it, the people that should have understood, and he's telling them, you guys are about to lose it, all of it. Because, number one, when I say anyone, I mean anyone is welcome. Whether you're on the list or not on the list. Whether you're a Jew, Samaritan, or Gentile. Anyone, when I say anyone, I mean anyone. And here he illustrates it in the story. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. And the guests I've invited aren't worthy of the honor. What would make them worthy? Accepting his invitation. What makes them not worthy? Rejecting his invitation. The wedding feast is ready and the guests I've invited aren't worthy to, of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone. Say everyone. Go on. Everyone. Go get everybody. Go get everybody that you see. Poor, rich, young, old, wise, dumb. Does not matter. I want people at my son's wedding Go get anyone. And over the years, we've gotten to the point that even when we hear Jesus say anyone, we think he's like a car salesman or or a cell phone salesman and go, yeah, right, there's got to be a catch. But with Jesus, there is no catch, no small, no hidden fees. It's open to anyone. And when Jesus said anyone, the crowds would have looked at his disciples and knew he meant it. You have to understand, to this society, Jesus was a rabbi. A rabbi is a teacher of God's word, which at that time was the Old Testament. That's called, that was called the uh, uh, Septuagint. And rabbis had extensive knowledge of the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, the writings of Moses. They also had great knowledge of the writings of the prophets. And rabbis were special because they had groups. Check this out. Come on, we'll give you a little history today. They're, they had groups called Talmids. So the Talmids, uh, these were disciples or students. So essentially every rabbi had a class of students. And what was, uh, what was amazing was that this was a very exclusive group. Wherever the rabbi went, the Talmids went. They followed him. They lived with him. They hung out together. For those students wanting to become one of the Talmuds of a particular rabbi, they had to go through an application process. First, there was a hefty prerequisite before even being considered to become a Talmud. These were the equivalent of a GPA or a transcript prerequisites for getting into any college or academy. They had to have a right SAT score. If you want to go to Harvard... 
you realize you better have a 4.0 GPA or a 32 on your ACT or a 1600 on your SAT. That's the standard to get into Harvard. Anybody qualify? <laughs> you ain't in that group. Well, it's the same with a Talmud applying to join a rabbi school. Talmud had an impressive knowledge of scripture and a rabbi would, would quiz them by, by ask, listening to their questions because in the Jewish culture, you prove your knowledge by how good of a question you could craft. You've heard me teach on this before. That's why Jesus was found at 13, confounding the leaders, the priests, and the temple with his question. That's just how they tested in their culture. But Talmuds were important to a rabbi. Listen, here's why. Because the, the excellence of the student reflected on the excellence of the teacher. So if you had Talmuds that were smart, that were wise, that, that they're, they're, they were making an impact, guess who looked great? The rabbi. But Jesus changed this system, especially when he invited a tax collector to be a Talmud. So when word gets out about this new rabbi who's coming to town, who's picking followers at random, people started to wonder what's going on. They came to hear from this incredible teacher named Jesus. But when they looked at his disciples, they must have been confused because they did not find a who's who of the city. They found a tax collector, a stinky fisherman. Here was this rabbi, and his Talmuds were nobodies. So when he steps up and says, anyone who wants to come can follow me, and they looked at his disciples, I promise you they believed him. And slowly but surely, people started to come and wanted to follow this rabbi Jesus. And they realized when he said, anyone. Amen. Amen. Second thing we can learn from the story is that anyone means everyone. But here's the struggle. Though we'd never say it, we don't really always buy into the idea that church can be for anyone. We kind of like church the way it is. We usually prefer things to stay the same. And when things stay the same, that becomes a standard. And pretty soon a standard becomes a qualification. And I think Jesus knew that's how things would go. And I think Luke 9.23 reminds us that there shouldn't be any qualifications for those that want to come to church. For those that want to follow Jesus. Matthew 22.10 says, so the servants brought in everyone they could find. Everyone they could find. Good and bad alike. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. So Jesus does away with the qualifications to follow. He got rid of the long list of prerequisites. And he really believed in this idea that anyone is everyone. He makes two more statements. And uh, here's one by Paul, actually, in Romans chapter 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice it didn't say just the Jews who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anybody. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, everyone who acknowledges me publicly on the earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Anybody can do that. Jesus is throwing the floodgates open. We usually don't talk about it, but we've got our own unwritten code, don't we? For instance, when I grew up in church, there was this unwritten dress code. Had to wear a tie, had to wear suits. But if you'll allow God, what, what's, what's been happening for about the last 25 to 30 years in the church, really strongly for the last 20, is Jesus is showing up and he's flipping our paradigms and our qualifications. I'll never forget when my paradigm got flipped. The church that I was a part of, we had just done an outreach, a big outreach called Convoy of Hope us and a bunch of other churches. And it's where you minister to those who are poor and broken. It was fantastic. That was on a Saturday morning. The next day, I was the associate pastor at the church, and so someone came and they got me out of the ready room. They said, hey man, 
there's these cars out front and people aren't getting out and they look a little strange. Now, first of all, how sad is it that people show up to church and we automatically put up our guard because they look a little strange? <laughs> and so I just asked the brother, I said, well, have you gone out and talked to him? He's like, no. It's like, you're a greeter. Go greet. <laughs> So I took him out with me, and I was just a young, young pup. Um, and in the car was this African American lady, and she said, "I was at Convoy of Hope yesterday, and you and your dad prayed for me and my family." I said, "Wow, that's awesome! Well, come on in." And she said, "No, we can't come in here." I said, "What do you mean you can't come in here?" She said, our clothes aren't good enough. I'll never forget it. I stood in the parking lot and my heart broke. And God began to shatter the Pharisee inside of me. The day that our clothes become a barrier to the cross, our clothes are wrong. And that day, I began to realize, man... I, I got I to gotta deal with some of this. And, then, and here's what happens. When God begins to show you stuff and you begin to deal with it, then you naturally get proud of yourself. Hey, yeah. And then you start a church. And everyone starts showing up. And now you have kids. And you begin to realize, as a pastor, I've got an unwritten code. I may not publicize it, but I do. And then just so happens that God puts someone into your life. And what usually happens for me is when God is using someone, they don't even know it. Because they're just being them. And then you see that Pharisee starting to rise up inside of you and you got to go deal with it. There was this one guest who came. I think it was the person's second time. And there's nobody in this church that was dressed like that. In fact, I had people mention it to me. It's like, yeah, I know. I see it. And I'm trying to be all cool, you know. It's no big deal. And yet inside, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. And my little girl came home. and She was like, daddy, I want those. I was like, What? unwritten code but anyone can come and in that moment I was like I went to my room and I said Jesus I need more of your heart there's a Pharisee in me because this church that's supposed to be for anyone can't be for anyone until I get the heart of anyone inside of me this person is one of is becoming somebody very dear to me and I'm so thankful that they were them so that God can make me more like him. What about you? What's your unwritten code? When Jesus said anyone, he meant everyone. And not only that, number three, he, he, he removed the qualifications. So to him, no qualifications, listen, means no excuses. You see, when Jesus invites anyone to follow him, he doesn't just break down the barriers that keep so many people from learning more about God. He gets rid of all the excuses different people use to keep themselves from God. What do you mean? Oh, how about the number one excuse? My past. Well, I've just messed up way too much. God can never love me because of this. Come on, man. That's the reason why they call it the past, because it's past. And these excuses can cause us to be very lackadaisical in our approach to the invitation of Jesus. Listen to me. Because I think hidden within this story is a message for a lot of us. And I don't have time to develop it, but I do want to hit it. But when the king came to meet the guest, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Now, please, this is not the whole clothes barrier thing. Friend, he asked him, 
How is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. If you were given an invitation to have dinner with the President of the United States, I promise you none of us would show up for that dinner wearing this. Because we would wear clothes that match the seriousness of the encounter. We would take the encounter seriously enough that we would make sure that we were ready. Here's the idea. This guy who got an invitation because somebody came and invited him and even showed up for the wedding. Why do you think he showed up? I think he showed up for free food. I want to come and enjoy. Pig out. Yeah. I want to see if the last barrel is as good as the first barrel. But he didn't take the occasion seriously enough. Please hear me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hear me today. America is ripe with Christian fans who do not take seriously the invitation of Jesus. So we live a lackadaisical life. And we think we're going to show up that day. And none of it's going to matter. When Jesus removed the qualifications, he canceled every one of our excuses. Every excuse we can have for not turning our life over to God. For not allowing God to change our life. When we stand before him, we will be asked, some of us will probably be asked, why didn't you change your life? Why didn't you do more with your life? And just like this man, we will have nothing to say. So what is your excuse been? What excuse have you used to stay exactly the same? To be a fan and not a follower. Anyone is welcome to have a relationship with Jesus. Anyone. Sexual past? Anyone. Ex-con? Anyone. Inmates? Anyone. Recently divorced? Anyone. Legalists? Anyone. Liberals? Anyone. Conservatives? Anyone. Alcoholics? Anyone. Potheads? Anyone. Addict? Anyone. Huh. I know there's none of these here today, but I'm going to finish it up with this anyway. Hypocrites. Anyone. Why do you think he's pleading for us? Because I think he's pleading to the king. Send another messenger. Don't give up on him yet. Don't kick him off the list. Please, Dad, send somebody else. And he's pleading. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Doesn't mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity. Some of you feel that way. You feel like things have gone down the hole in your life and you wonder, God, where are you? Do you love me? Doesn't mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death. As the as scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, or fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is Paul saying? you got no excuse to not follow Jesus. None. Now we need to be ready for what can happen when we embrace this invitation that's to everyone. Because if anyone can come to church, that'll kind of mess things up. All of a sudden, 
the church gets filled with a lot of interesting people. I mean, if we really accept anyone into our churches to follow Christ, we'll be forced to deal with our own unwritten codes. We'll be forced to get out of our comfort zones and rub shoulders with people that are from different backgrounds and people who have different music collections and recreational activities than us. People whose wardrobes confuse or annoy us. People who are hard to tolerate and even harder to love. But followers are willing to break down walls, trash, unwritten codes, and welcome anyone into God's family right alongside Jesus. Some of you are probably thinking, wait a minute, we can't just let anyone in, into our church. We can't just let people show up and invite them into God's family and tolerate anything they want because that's not biblical. I agree. It's not biblical. I'm not saying that we tolerate or condone anything sinful. When a person wants to become a Christian, it's right to make sure they understand what God's word allows and what it doesn't. There's, that's a message for another day, but there is some standards there. But when Jesus makes the invitation, he says anyone. So some people who respond to that invitation will have a past that you don't approve of, clothes that you don't like. They'll just be different. But fan, because fans don't know how to handle people that are different. They prefer to have everybody just like them. Because they like being comfortable. They like saying, I like our church. I know everybody. I didn't start this church to know you. At least, not everybody. We started this church because God put a passion in our hearts for anyone's. But today I want to challenge us with this last one because though it is anyone, it's also everything. The king then said to his aides, bind this guy's hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. What did he mean by that? There have been fantastic ministers throughout church history that have written great messages that I could never hope to touch answering this question. But let me give you my interpretation. of it. What is the difference between a person who is called and a person who is chosen. If we use Jesus' story to extrapolate an answer, it would be this. Those that are chosen are those who not only accept, but those who take seriously the encounter. Those who move from just being a fan to being a follower. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verses 21 through 22, looking at this man, there was this guy that came to Jesus and, and he, was follow, he was a fan of Jesus, but he wanted to become a follower. And he asked Jesus, what must I do to enter into the kingdom of heaven to gain eternal life? And he says, I kept all, I've kept all the law since I was a kid. And he was very wealthy. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for this young man. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, for he had many possessions. I was speaking with a young man who, who is uh, getting ready to, to launch a church, and uh, we were just talking, and I was just talking to him about writing his message series and stuff. And so I was sharing with him kind of what I was going to say today, and we got into a discussion about this because he really believes that if you don't give up everything, you can't follow Jesus from this story. And I was just talking with the young man, and I said, wait a minute. <clears throat> There's a deeper thing going on here than just this young man being asked to give up his money. You see, God knows the linchpin of your heart. He knows the last straw that will break your back. He knows that which is the greatest barrier to your connection to him. And I promise you, whatever that linchpin is, that is what you must give. To this young man, it was his wealth. To some of us, it's our anger. To some of us, 
It's our pleasures. To some of us, it's our dreams. Whatever it is that makes it hard for you to become a follower of Christ, it is that which God will ask for. Because he is more concerned about getting all of your heart. And he says, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Remember that statement we talked about last week? Those that are willing to go the extra mile and give up everything. That's the price. When Jesus makes his invitation, he welcomes anyone who would come after him. But he also makes it clear that when you choose to follow him, you must give up everything. When a Talmud was finally accepted into a rabbi's school, they would leave their homes, their jobs, whatever was holding them back, and they would go and follow the rabbi. Literally, they would follow the rabbi wherever he went. Now, to follow this rabbi named Jesus, there was a cost. In fact, one person said, I want to follow you, Jesus. And he said, well, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Where are we going to sleep? Guess what? The guy didn't follow Jesus. Because the price was too high. Does the price seem too high for you to deal with the unwritten codes of your heart? If we're going to be more than fans of Jesus, we've got to let Jesus give us an any one heart. We've got to let Jesus impress on us that there is no qualifications for anyone to become a fan. But we also must deal with this truth, that to become a follower, to become more than a fan, we're going to have to deal with that issue that we don't want to deal with between us and God. And every one of us knows what it is. So I ask you again this morning, based on what I've shown you from the story, surely you must realize you have no excuse to not deal with that issue. And we will never become a church for the anyone's. And we will never become a church that takes anyone's and turns them into fans. And we will never be the drive of our heart to be a church that takes fans and turns them to followers. Until we all are fully committed followers of Christ. So I ask you today, what's your excuse? What's your reason to stay distant from God? I encourage you to deal with it. Let's pray. Lord, I pray today. Lord, I thank you, first of all, that, Jesus, you have in any one heart that anyone can come. And I thank you, Father, that you are so gracious, that you are so kind, that you work with people even like me. Thank you, God, for continually working on me. Lord, I pray that if it be your will that this, your church, grows and we have multiple leaders. I say publicly what I've been saying to you privately for the last two months as I've been dealing with this, you and me. I have one request, only one, that our staff page, on our page, nobody looks like me. I pray that our staff, our leaders, we will visibly display anyone. May we not be so obsessed with just getting a certain type of anyone, but truly God, give us your anyone heart. Broken, anyone. Drug addict, anyone. Hurting, anyone. Single mother, anyone. Single father, anyone. Enslaved in debt, anyone. Angry, anyone. Disappointed in God, anyone. But I've been so impressed watching the Olympics see the melting pot on display. People wearing our flag that look like they're from another country. May this church look like that someday. May we be in any one place.
God, though that's an admirable desire, may we not miss the challenge of today's message. We can never reach anyone until first, Father, you reach everyone in here. Whatever the linchpin issue is between me and you or them and you, I pray that you will move on us to begin to deal with that issue between us and you. I pray, God, for those that have used excuses to keep them from taking the next step in their relationship with Jesus. I pray that they will hear today they have no excuse because no one's going to condemn them. No one's going to hold anything against them, especially you. So there's no excuse not to come to you and to deal with whatever that is. And I sense your presence in this place. In fact, I, in fact, I'm just going to be quiet. And why don't you take this opportunity to start that conversation between you and God? I'm going to give you a minute. Maybe that's not you. I invite you to just listen. Some of you in this room today, there's a few of us, you feel like you have messed up your life so bad. But you realize and have really begun to realize recently that you've been given a second chance. What are you going to do differently now than you did then to make the next phase of your life better than the last? If in the last phase of your life you were lackadaisical, you were the guy at the wedding, you were just there to enjoy it, but didn't really commit to the event. If that was you in your last stage, why be that way in the new stage? Because if you're that way in the new stage, you're just going to relive your past. If you are someone who, is, who wants to change your future, you must make different decisions than you did in the past. You'll never change your tomorrow until you learn the lessons of yesterday. And one of those lessons that many of us need to learn is I gotta get serious with this connection with God. Now I know this feels weird to some of you. This is what I grew up on. If you don't sense the presence of God today, um, I'm sorry because Lord is here. He's challenging a lot of us. 